Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks, Sherry. We also want to thank Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping, your first three years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinator insects, both wild and managed, before they disappear. Learn more on our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and our guest co-host, Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, everybody. We hope you were able to listen to our Pollinator Week series of podcasts, our typical month's number of po- episodes all in one week. That was a lot of fun, wasn't it, Kim? Uh, yeah, and a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> whole, a whole month wrapped into a week. You, you're wearing me out here, Jeff. But it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we got to talk to some neat people. Yeah, we did. And that's why we took last Monday or last Monday off, too. We 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 got a little over ambitious. I think we said that we'd have a podcast last episode last Monday, but uh, you think to one day is going to make up for this? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to have to. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to our talk today with James Wilkes and Joe, Joseph Kazier about their B World B Count project, and uh, this involves data, computers, and pulling all that together. You know, I'm looking forward to this one, Kim. Yeah, I got a whole bunch of techie people I'm talking to today. <laughs> I'm, out, I'm, I'm out numbered three to one, but I got to tell you, you know, James Wilkin, you know, runs Hive Tracks, yeah, and uh, jo- Joseph Cazier and I have worked together a lot on bee culture when I was still there. Yeah, uh, he's heading towards a book on his subject on the genius hive. So um, I want to catch up with him and Hive Tracks and everything else they're doing today, especially bee count. Uh, it's going to be a good episode. I'm looking forward to it. Let's jump right into it. Hey, we want to welcome Dr. James Wilkes and Dr. Joseph Cazier to the Beekeeping Today podcast. Thanks, guys, for joining us. It is our pleasure. Thank you, Jeff and Kim. Yeah. Oh, it's good to have you guys back. Um, I've worked with both of you off and on over a lot of years, both at the magazine and the Kim and Jim show and and uh, on our podcast. So. You guys are on another project now, and that's what we want to talk about today. And then I'd like to go back and t- have you update us on the Genius Hive that we talked about last time. So right now, you guys are involved in something called the Bee Count. And and what is it, and why should I care? All right. So what we're doing is we are trying to get a measure and get a picture of the pollinators from around the world, including bees, but but any pollinator. This is a nice measure of the health status of our pollinators. It's a nice measure of the dispersion of of honeybees and other pollinators across the world, and really a measure of the biodiversity of our planet. And, uh, And so what we're asking everybody to do as a citizen science effort is to download our app, go to beescount.org, and it's free. And then take a picture of a pollinator or a, a bunch of pictures and just upload them to the website. And, and in addition to the data that's being gathered, it's a great engagement tool to help raise awareness uh, about pollinators and where they are. And then we can talk about some kind of analytics that we'll plan on doing that later on. Our, our top level goal of this is really an awareness campaign. Um, and But to make this as easy as possible for people to 
to be involved and for people to have a way of contributing to, uh, you know, what's going on with pollinators in the world. And, and so we, we had this sort of brainstorm idea. Uh, it was a little over a year ago when this was, was born, but um, just what's the most simple way that we could, anybody with a cell phone, you know, can, can engage with this and, and uh, really want people to understand how pollinators are fundamental to our food systems and, and just to life on the planet. How does this work? So the, the, I, I go out, I've downloaded the app. I take a picture of a, a fly on a flower or a honeybee on a flower, a pollinator on a flower. I, I snap the picture with the camera. It goes to a database. What happens to that photograph and what other data is collected at that point? So we wanted to be really mindful about privacy and protecting either your sweet honey spot or, or wherever you're going. And so we've been careful to minimize any personal information that's collected. So what is collected is there is a picture. With that picture comes some geo coordinates in most cell phone applications. We round that to the nearest uh, three kilometers so that it's, and that's kind of the Apomondia guideline from the Data Standardization Committee, so that it's enough to be useful. You can see the flora and fauna around, but not so much they can walk up to that flower in your backyard. There's a, generally a timestamp, which we truncate, but it, it gives a nice uh, approximation of the time. And that's most of the data. You can volunteer to enter an email address and be notified but we don't link the email address to the pictures in any way. Um, and so that information is there. And so pictures, location, timestamp, but they're enough information. We can start to do some nice machine learning and some nice other things on the images and map them across the world to see uh, the state of our pollinators to a certain degree. We purposely made it, like I said before, as simple as possible. Um, to get the most level of engagement. And, and so there's kind of, if you have your scientific hat on, you're going, well, what about, you have all these additional questions to ask about the data, you know, how good it is and, and things like that. Um, and, and that's certainly uh, a component of this, uh, but would be, you know, kind of sec again, in my estimation, secondary to let's just get people to open their eyes and, and see flowers and, and bugs on them and, and snap a photo. Um, and, and so, again, that's, that's the primary objective. You want people to get close enough to a bee to take a picture. It's challenging, but it's <laughs> also know. addicting. Once you, once you do it and, and start, even as a beekeeper, I mean, I'm used to, you know, bees and seeing them all the time. But when I really started focusing, I, I have a little blueberry patch here next to my house, and it is just the – best place for you know a variety of pollinators and and chasing them around and trying to get the you know the best shot uh, with your phone uh it's quite amazing the the kinds of images that you you do end up with you can you can get some really nice nice shots with the the way cameras are on phones these days joseph i want to go back to what you were having to say your title is the executive director of the center for analytic research and education and just earlier, you were mentioning Apomondia. Are is that part of Apomondia? So, um, so a couple of things about Apomondia. So, first of all, this idea was really born when James and I were in Rome in February, right around Valentine's Day, to do a presentation with Apomondia at a symposium, and also to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Commission, and over some of the dinners and, and meetings of the days with the Apomonia executives, we started really thinking about engagement and how to do this. And so this idea was born and, and then we've uh, been successful now in, in making this come to happen. So, so there is a relationship to this project and Apomonia and they've, uh, we've been talking to them and they've endorsed it as well. In addition to that, um, the Center for Analytics Research and Education is a center at the university both James and I work at, uh, Appalachian State University. And so that is a research and education center. And our mission is to kind of do analytics for good and do these things that really help the planet. And um, in addition to that, 
I chair the Apomonia Committee on Working Group, really, on data standardization for all things related to bees and bee standardization. And so that's a working group that's trying to map out how to bring data together, prepare it for analysis, and turn it into useful things. And that committee, as well, has officially endorsed this initiative as a way to um, collect a data set and to get people engaged. Um, and so I, I would say there's several ties to Apomundia that um, some formal, some informal that are there for, since the beginning of this project. Okay, well, we just talked to Jeff Pettis, who's now the president yeah. of Apomundia. So you've got, a, you've got a friend in high places there. <laughs> yes, we do. We, we've had uh, several conversations I, um, with, with Jeff and others up there uh, about this initiative. I think, uh, Joseph, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, Jeff was there when we were in Rome that that period in February of 2019. Yeah, we were. Uh, we, we went for this Apomonia Symposium and UN presentation we mentioned and sharing this apartment and talking all day about bees and pollinators. That's really where this idea was born, and they had a lot of enthusiasm. So we went back to the drawing board and and put this together and, and eventually made it happen. When we talk, when you talk about data standardization, most people don't understand what is data standardization, what does that entail, and how is that helpful for me and for the bee industry? Yeah, so I'm happy to talk about that, Jeff. And so a, a couple of things about data standardization. So one thing is, is that there's a lot of companies out there, a lot of beekeepers that are collecting data. Sometimes the data is you put a brick on top of your hive and that means something, <laughs> you turn it a different way, it means something else. Sometimes it's a spreadsheet of some kind or a piece of paper. And sometimes it's in an application like Hive Tracks or from sensors like some of the other companies out there. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that it's very difficult to put all that data together because it, it means different things to different people and it's recorded in different ways. And so by standardization, what we mean is, can we come up with a common language, a common set of definitions so that if you're gonna put a hive in, in a database or on a piece of paper, here's what it means. And, and if somebody else is gonna record scale data or anything else, and what it does is it, it links that together in a way that all that data can be combined. Because if you're gonna do machine learning in apiculture, for example, you really need a large data set and no beekeeper is big enough on their own to really do that effectively. And so it takes a way to merge a lot of that data in order to get the promising tools of precision apiculture in there. And so this data standardization committee is really working to define the standard. And that includes identifying what the most important things are, identifying how to measure them, and then a technical architecture. We're using XML, we can talk about why, but it, which is a way to kind of merge those data sets together technically. And there's a couple of articles in Bee Culture that we wrote about this maybe uh, about 18 months ago, uh, BXML part one and part two. Mm -hmm. And so if they're interested, they're, they can certainly go back to Bee Culture and look through the archives and there's some nice articles on that. Are the product manufacturers signing on to this? Several of the technology providers um, are have a voice on the committee, and many of them are members. and uh, And it is my fervent hope that that will continue, and that through collaboratively moving forward, we'll agree on these common definitions. There's been a lot of interest, mm -hmm. still a lot of progress to be made. You have to negotiate and work through all this process, and agree and figure out how to merge things. But I am I'm very optimistic that uh, this will take life. And we have um, several ideas on, on how to do that and how to move that forward. And, and this project, this World Bee Count, is one aspect of that because we're gathering a large data set here in the first 10 days or so of the app launch. We've got about 10,000 images that have already been submitted wow. and will be continuing for some period of time. And then hopefully every year, some version of this will continue to collect data. And so... And so if we start standardizing that and start defining these formats, then that's a way for this to really grow. And again, the goal is to get all the data speaking the same language so you can put it together 
And then these cool techniques can come back and benefit beekeepers with appropriate anonymization and, and mm -hmm. other things to protect the individual privacy and security. Well, that would really be useful as a, as a beekeeper, being able to have mix and match technologies and have them all be able to correlate or work together in some fashion or at least read the data from all of them. Yeah, the way we like to describe that is uh, we, we want to create a data ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, so, so that these components can, can uh, feed one another, if you will, right, and, and, and work together so that, that we get the benefit of all these, these uh, data elements that are out there. They might be from different providers, uh, uh, some in the B space, some secondary data sources. I mean, your weather and land use and, and agriculture, you know, uh, plantings and, and things like that, all those are, are part of the equation for the health of a honeybee colony. And, and so providing a, a framework for us to gather that data and, and uh, work together collaboratively, even in a competitive environment, mm -hmm. if you will, right? Uh, but, but in a way that, that adds value to all of sure. us is, is a way to, to think about that. And a practical example that within this project right now uh, that's come out of that committee is this uh, concept of, of how precise can we, uh, should we keep a location, right? Uh, in, in beekeeping in particular, your, your yard location is, is an important piece of, of private data for you as a beekeeper. Uh, I would suggest for commercial beekeepers, it's even, uh, I would call it a trade secret uh, in, in, in the business sense of that. And, and so it's important to, for us to provide mechanisms for maintaining that, that privacy, uh, which overall privacy, at least for me, uh, is, is very important concept. Uh, and data ownership is, is something that's an emerging area in technology that has been kind of ignored and, and created uh, imbalances, if you will. Uh, in, in the ownership of information. And we, we want to, uh, we believe data standardization will help uh, facilitate bringing balance back to that, that information uh, power struggle. So you're collecting a lot of data. You, you, you said you had, what, 10,000 photographs, bits of data uh, already collected in the first, what, three days of the app being out? Um, About 10, 10 each days. Yeah. Where is it hosted? So, uh, so right now it's, it's kind of with the developer we've been working with. It's coming into our research center at the university for long-term hosting, and it will be kept there and privatized and kept behind a firewall, except for the goal is to, once it's been anonymized and fuzzied a little bit to, to protect privacy, that um, we want this data to be available both for people to interact with. And there's a pollinator map. You can go click on your hometown and see all the images submitted from your region or any region you might go to on vacation. You mm -hmm. can see, you can go click there and see what the pollinators look like. And, and then we want researchers, data scientists, and others to have access to the data. So our hope is to, uh, to open source and share this data with the world so we can do analysis we can overlay it with other data sources to enrich it. We can do some image processing. We can look not only at the pollinators, but the flowers that they're on. And that can tell us something about the environment that are in, kind of in the background and other things. So there's a lot of things that can be done. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is to build, as James mentioned, this data ecosystem and use this as kind of one of the hubs to get that started and then expand over time. And just one last <laughs> technical question, but is is the information anonymized at the point of collection once it reaches your server, after it's been on your server? At what point does that fuzziness occur? So in, in terms of the fuzziness, and I think you're talking about truncating the time and also the Location, geo, yeah, geo coordinates, mm -hmm. geo, geo location, and so when it's collected, embedded in the picture is that precise location, mm -hmm. and then it will come into our university servers. That will be preserved at least for a while, but locked down. And then before it goes out anywhere in the world, it's rounded and truncated and fuzzy. Should 
And that's because, Jeff, if there are certain high specialty research applications that may need a little more precision, then what it would need to do is somebody would go to an IRB re institutional review board that reviews privacy and other policies. And they would not be able to look at that data unless they passed one of those review boards that for 50 years have been reviewing research projects and have a lot of experience with that. But, but inside, behind the firewall at the university, we're keeping that more precise in case there is a good reason for analysis to use it. But they have to get approval by going through a review board to, to do that. Otherwise, the anonymized fuzzy data, the plan is to make that available um, to researchers everywhere. Yeah. Thanks. But one, one other one other point on that, Jeff, yeah. is is the if you submit an image, there's there's nothing that associates you like your email or anything with that image. We keep that separate. So uh, the the image itself, there's no personal personally identifiable information associated with that, even in the database. So uh, there's no way to know that you submitted. You know, you could infer right if that they were all from a particular geolocation, but there's nothing uh, specific in there that says that Jeff submitted these 10 pictures other than the sign in the back of my b yard that says jeff's b yard olympia Correct. washington <laughs> <laughs> what i'm trying to figure out guys is uh, this just seems like a picture of a b it's that it's that um, i don't even know how to ask the question i can't believe that anybody cares who took the picture or where they took it but apparently they do right I, Kim, I, I don't know that anybody necessarily cares. We are just being having an abundance of caution on this, just just in case, and and so that's why we're going through this before we share any data with the world. This rounding and other exercise, but but you're right. It's it, and it's not just a bee; it's any pollinator. So birds, bats, butterflies, beetles, and and Kim, there 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 are uh, emerging laws and 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 policies and things. Uh, GDPR is one in the EU that, that there are requirements if you're collecting data that you have to meet a certain standards and, and protocols uh, to, to be in compliance. So that, that's, that's where some of these things come from. And, and they may seem like uh, overkill, uh, but at the same time, I, th I think it's something that gets overlooked. This is more general concept that gets overlooked. And, and I don't want us to start out <laughs> in the wrong place. But but from the beginning, let's say we care about the privacy of the data. We're going to take care of it. Uh, we want people to trust, you know, uh, to generate trust in this, especially as we progress. And 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 for us, from the beekeeper side, you know, uh, with my hive tracks hat on, you know, that's critically important to beekeepers to have, you know, uh, know that they can trust somebody with that information that it's not going to get to places that they don't want it to be. And, and that link to your picture, as James said, I mean, we couldn't even find it if we had a court order. We, we just, there's never is that data collected to be able to link an individual picture to a person, just a location and a timestamp, but not any one machine or person. Well, I guess like my bank, I would much rather have it overprotected than underprotected. So uh, my hat's off to you for taking all of, for going through all of these um, procedures and precautions so that, like you said, you don't want to start in the wrong place because it could only go downhill from there. So I guess that's, I guess that's a good thing. I, I was a little, I was a little, thought it a little strange, but I guess it's a good thing. Uh, Kim, we really just want people to be comfortable sharing citizen science data of any pollinator that they're out there. And that's what we care about. Whoever submitted it, thank you. Um, but we just want to have this data so it can be analyzed and, and given back to the world, whatever, whatever insights come from it. So it's not just, uh, Joseph, it's not just you and James doing this. You have supporters. Who all supporting the world, uh, uh, the beescount.org? Yeah, I'll take the first crack at that. Uh, one, there's three kind of founding partners, uh, I would say, that, that, that initiated this. <laughs> okay, four. Four partners. <laughs> <laughs> My colleague in the background was offended. <laughs> okay, Joseph, I'll let you go. 
while the dog's barking. So, so as I mentioned, the idea was born at an Apomondia symposium, and that's really, you know, with their moral support, kind of gave us the courage to to proceed. Um, and then the kind of founding entities that really got serious about this, Hive Tracks, and and James especially leading kind of the development team to build the app with that deep software expertise and ten years of experience in the in the B space. Uh, CARE, the Center for Analytics Research and Education that I direct sort of from the data side to be the ultimate hosting body and to make use of it and do data science on the bees is another one. And so that's kind of the hat I'm wearing today. And then uh, the World Bee Project uh, is another group that's kind of helping with some of the promotion and, and other things. And so those are kind of the official, you'll see kind of on the website. And then there's a couple of other entities that have been uh, very helpful and, and, and engaged as supporters. Uh, Flowhive has been very active in, in helping, particularly around the development. Uh, SAS, the analytics company out of North Carolina, has been very helpful in giving time and expertise and hosting resources to help enable the world pollinator map. And, and actually, Bear Crop Sciences has come in to help analyze the data and, or to provide funding for our students and faculty and friends to help analyze the data and make it open source and other things. They don't have any role in how the data is used other than providing funds to enable that. And so we want to thank them for sponsoring CARE in that data management role as well. And then, of course, Apomondia's, I don't know that there's an official voted on role, but they've been really their leaders have been involved in encouraging this from the beginning. And then we, we also don't want to leave out uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Uh, we were able to get a slot in their World Bee Day uh, program last Wednesday. And, and so Joseph and uh, one of our other colleagues, Max Runzel, uh, uh, we need to mention him. He, he was a key uh, component. He was kind of the project coordinator, or he was the, the project coordinator for the World Bee Count. And, and kind of was the glue that, that had uh, bridged these three partner organizations coming forward. Um, and, and he was working at the FAO office at, in Rome at, at, at the UN, so was able to uh, help facilitate us getting on their program. And, and so that was a great, great uh, thing for us to be part of as well. And, and Max was there. We met him in Italy on the trip where this idea was born. So... Uh, he's been really been involved since uh, the beginning as well. That's some pretty high-powered backing you guys got. I, re I recall SAS back in my college days. They were the people who were responsible for making the punch cards we gathered our data on uh, when, we were, when we were measuring soybean um, pollination. So they've been involved in data analytics forever, it seems like. Uh, I'd say they're going on about 50 years, 50 some years um, at least. And they they are very active and they are, um, again, they're supporting. And, and the, right now the world pollinator map that if you go to Bees Count and click on it, that is powered by SAS technology. Very nice. It's a great website. It's what, nicely done. What is, uh, so where do you see the, the Bees Count going? Where, where, where will you be in a year and in, in three years Five years down the road. We want this to live and to grow. Now, we've come together on faith because we thought this was a good idea. And we've all chipped in. There's a lot of volunteer time, very little uh, funding, a little on the backside. But but really, this has been a, a volunteer labor of love on almost all parties to, sh to show the engagement value in this. I mean, we didn't want to just wait around and hope someday somebody would believe in it and fund it. We thought, you know, the best thing we can do is let's build it. Let's show the world. Let's get the value out of it. And the hope is, is that we can find a way to, to make this live on. Now, certainly more people using the app helps because uh, that helps build the data. But eventually we need to find a sustainable funding model for this. Because, again, the app is free. We're donating time and labor on a lot of things, there's, you know, some, a little bit of financing, but it's cost way more in time and effort um, to make this happen. But it's because we believe in it and our supporters believe in it, that, that we're doing it. And so 
we invite everybody to kind of, if they like it, to help us think about ways to continue it. And, and if there's any way to chip in and time or resources or funding or connections or anything to make this live on. Yeah. I'd say we're in, you know, kind of a, a, a phase of, of what's next, you know, how do, how do we, how do we make this live on? There's organizational kind of things that we have to questions we have to answer. Uh, as, as Joseph said, this was a, a, a collaborative effort. There's no entity uh, called the world B count, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that kind of is, is the steward of this. And, and so what does that look like moving forward? We're, we're having discussions about that and, and, you know, are open to figuring that out. We want it to work out and, and are, you know, trying to figure out what that looks like. James and I are both entrepreneurs as are some of our friends. So we just tend to do stuff. Yeah. And so we, we just jumped in to, to do it and then hopefully, uh, you know, we can find a way to sustain it. I'm going to go back to something that was mentioned a little while ago and see if we can catch up. Uh, uh, James talked about his hive tracks role. And the last time we talked to you guys, um, uh, you mentioned your, and, and when, when you were writing for the magazine, when I was still there, you guys were talking about the genius hive and how's that uh, it's been about a year or so. How's that going now? Uh, in terms of where we are now, we've made a lot of progress. Some of the progress is really realizing just how far we have to go to collect the data we need to do really deep machine learning. And so, you know, I direct a center for analytics. And if you go into a big corporation, they've got data sitting around everywhere from uh, in servers and other things. But if you go to a beekeeper and they have, you know, five or 50 or 100 or even 5,000 hives, you know, that data is kept differently. It's maybe not even in a computer or other things. And so this data standardization effort that we're talking about earlier is really about enabling that data to be collected so it, it can be analyzed. In addition to that, what we're doing is taking the data we have. So James and his operation and other friends are really focused on collecting high quality data sets. And then we have data from some of our friends. Uh, Bear has given us data. Uh, and some other data sets. We've got some friends in, in around the world that are sharing IoT, Internet of Things data, and other things. And so we're starting to prove some um, some models. So we uh, one of the last articles we wrote for Bee Culture came out in middle towards the end of 2019. We showed some Varroa maps that were based on some of the disease modeling and that could be done in real time based on some of the data in Hive Tracks. We're building this. Um, model here with the pollinator map and there'll be some more analytics and what we want to do uh, Kim and Jeff is is starting to build a hub to where all these tools that are being developed can be found in a place and and have a place that people can go and see them and open source them and then I know that that James over at Hive Tracks and other people are really also uh, moving forward with putting some smart elements in in some of their software as well. Uh, okay, where can I get one? <laughs> it sounds too good to be true. I know, I know the articles. I've uh, you actually remember my magazine better than I do, but um, I, I'm looking forward to some of this coming out, continuing to come out because I can see the value of it. Uh, Genius Hive is the right the right name for it. Um, so. Okay, that's you're collecting data and you're collecting more data and you've been collecting more data, and the analytics part of it is progressing. How is that? What can what can the Genius Hive do today? Okay, uh, so there's several things. So so we've um, we've got some uh, papers that just came out and some other scientific validation things. And so what we have that's currently available now is if you have high scale data, we've developed algorithms that have been peer reviewed and published that can kind of predict the health of that hive down the road. And so that's one thing that's, that's kind of there now. Another thing that's uh, available and is built into hive tracks and um, Broodminder and some of the other systems is the healthy colony checklist. Healthy colony checklist really lays a foundation for doing the genius hive because what that is is a 
standardized way that we've been testing and validating to assess a hive's health. And once everybody starts using that, there's a several features that immediately become available. One is, is you can see your own health on a standardized valid measure you can trust, as opposed to now you kind of open up the hive and look and, and different people see different things. Two, you can share that data with other people around the, in the community. And if you're in a bee club, you can see how is your community as a whole doing. You can look at how things are moving. And so those things are enabled by that. There's some, uh, on some of those sensors, we've developed some models on particularly on the weight that you can take the, um, you can kind of subtract out the human intervention and you can overlay that with some of the other factors and really see the impact of just the bees and their honey and kind of filter out that. Some of the early weight data that comes in has been kind of hard to make sense out of. And so this is kind of an algorithm that filters through that and makes it, it a little <laughs> more useful and it can tell you when it's time to feed and other things. And so these are in the lab. They still need to make the leap to the software, but these are in the lab. The other thing is, is um, working this summer and over the next few months to kind of publish some maps that people can go to and kind of see the state of things like flight hours and other things over time. And so stay tuned for that to come out pretty soon. That is the challenge of all of this is that with the technology today, there's all sorts of data available, but what does a beekeeper, how does a beekeeper use it to manage his bees is, is really becoming the, the challenge to filter out all the noise or see the correlations uh, that are significant and, and, and causal or, or things they need to pay attention to. I, I have to admit that um, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be a few years ago. The data is more fractured and less standardized than I was hoping it would be coming from, you know, I started out precision agriculture back in the 90s. And, and I'm amazed at how much farther ahead they are than we are with, with, the, uh, with the, the bees today in terms of having those algorithms and those features built in. And so I think we've made progress. A lot of the progress, honestly, is laying the base and the foundation. But we are starting to see some tools emerge, and we're committed to that. And, and uh, I hope you'll have us back as we start releasing some of them. And, and not just us. I mean, uh, in speaking from the university side, you know, our mission with the research we're doing is, is to prove and validate these things, show their usefulness, and then release them to the world so that they can be made available and useful to, to everybody out there. Well, you know that you, you got into an industry whose last major technological advancement was in the 1850s with, <laughs> with the invention of the Langstroth Hive. No one gave I, you that heads up on, on that. <laughs> I, you know, I, I thought farming was behind in the, in the 90s when I, was, when I was working in that industry oh, yeah. and integrating technology. No, they got rid of, the, they got rid of the, the horse and plow a long time ago. <laughs> No, but th sorry. this is a consummate challenge. Yes. Um, so it's yes. it, it's I will admit it's gone a lot slower than I thought, but it's still there. Yeah. And we're we're making progress um, in that. And I would like to jump in here to kind of update what I find an exciting uh, direction that that I find hive tracks going in, and, and I think Kim will be able to relate to this uh, quite easily. And in that, the, one of the problems that exists in the, in the beekeeping industry today is honey, whether it's honey prices, honey authentication, honey, uh, fake honey, all, all these different uh, aspects of honey. Uh, and, and so hive tracks has really, moving in a direction to bring tools to beekeepers to address uh, honey authentication, to give them leverage in the beekeeping marketplace or the honey market space uh, for their honey. And, and really it, it's, it, to me, it's, it's very interesting because it, it, it reflects the way that beekeepers 
if you go to a local bee, you know, a, a farmer's market or a local beekeeper and people say, buy your honey from a local uh, beekeeper, you, how do they convince you that their honey is what they say it is? You know, there, there's a, there's a back and forth, there's a conversation, there's a relationship with this beekeeper that you grow to trust them and, and, and you buy their product. And, and so capturing that digitally and providing that into the supply chain and, and beyond your local farmer's market is, is, is really the concept that we are really running with right now and, and very excited about and, and, and view some uh, a high impact into that to address that problem, which is interestingly enough, it is a global problem from the, the local you know, store in my hometown that sells what I would say is fake honey right next to what I believe is real honey because it's my honey. Uh, and, and up to the global scale of, of all the issues that we have with trans shipping and, and just mislabeling and blending and, and all the issues that, that are, that are with honey. And, and, and so this is a, 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 a local to global problem and, and there are no good solutions out there uh, that they, they have their own inherent issues. And, and we are really taking that head on. I believe you'll see that coming out in the next year from us. We recently talked to uh, some, some uh, of the honey experts in, in, um, in a meeting I was at and the saying that he came up with there and you just reiterated again is there is no basement on how low the price of some honeys will go and no ceiling on how much will come in uh, at those prices. So it is definitely a global problem and definitely something beekeepers need to solve. And uh, boy, the, the more you can do, the better it'll be. I, I think we're up to the challenge. Uh, and, and it's personal for me because I, I deal with this in my own, for my own business from, or my son's business. Uh, we, we have sourwood honey is a high end varietal. And, and we will stand by that all day long. I mean, we can take you to the bee yard, show you where it's made, how many hives we have there, how much honey do we produce. There's, there's all manner of data or evidence that supports what we claim about our honey. And we can stack that up against any other, you know, honey that's out there. And, and that's the concept that we're, we're bringing to the table. Yeah, that's a definitely an important topic that I think everyone's is questioning and, and concerned about. Any last thing you want to mention before we uh, give you back the rest of your day? So I have been talking to to Kim now for uh, some period of time about uh, a desire to write a book uh, based in part on some of the articles that have been in Bee Culture, but taking it farther and really making the case for a genius hive and what it would take to build it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been kind of slow coming. It takes a lot of time to write a book and this uh, coronavirus uh, upending everything hasn't hasn't sped that along. Uh, but my hope is to uh, to get back to that. I've got a sabbatical coming up and I, I hope to carve out some time and, and hopefully get that out early next year. That'd be good. Look forward to it. My final thoughts would be the purpose of this uh podcast was to talk about, you know, bees count and, and the world bee count. And so I would just encourage all the listeners to go right now to beescount.org, download the app for your uh, Android or iPhone and go out and take a picture and submit it and get your location on the map. Right. And, and go look at the map. It's quite fascinating to take it. You can take a tour of the world and see what pollinators everybody has captured and in and, and, and these images. And uh, it, it's just a lot of fun. So use all your networks out there, encourage people to do this. It's an easy way for you to get engaged and, and to spread awareness of pollinators. Well, James and Joseph, we really appreciate you joining us on the show today. You're both friends of the podcast. I look forward to having you back both as guest and or as an occasional audio postcard. James, thanks for those. And, uh, and and keep up the good work. I, this is, in my mind, uh, needed and be useful down the road. Yeah, thanks, guys. I appreciate your time and the updates. And uh, I'm 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 sign me up for one of those genius hives. I'm ready.
And thanks y'all for having us as well. This is always a lot of fun. I enjoy talking to you all and uh, look forward to continued conversations. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for everything you do for uh, bees and beekeepers everywhere. Well, thank you. All right. Take care. Stay safe. Well, I told you that was going to be good. That I really enjoyed uh, their. I enjoyed talking to them. I'm happy about their special guest, uh, James Wilkes, uh, extra boss that he had there in the background. <laughs> yeah, the the bee count. Um, you know how they pull all of this stuff together, and you're mm-hmm. going to make end up the the bee counts part of the genius hive, and all of the other things that they're doing. I think the thing that impressed me the most. Well, a couple of things, really. One of them is their incredible attention to privacy. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't thought about it that much, but when you start putting a lot of data up in the cloud, somebody somewhere is going to take it and use it some way you don't want. And the other thing was their talk about the Genius Hive. Um, I, I hope I'm around long enough to see that work. I would just love to turn on my computer and have my computer tell me it's time to feed. Uh <laughs> Well, you know, you can all, you can almost do that right now. They're they're close to doing that, and which is kind of fun. Once you get all the sensors that are available out there, you know, I run some Broodminder uh, sensors, and and it's fun to go out there every morning and just check to see, uh, you know, if they're gaining weight, they're losing weight, and the temperature of the brood chamber, and even in the springtime when it runs from. Uh, you can tell when they they expand the brood chamber up into the upper box. It's it's fun to see because you can see the temperature changes. It's it's having your having that all available and not having to go out there and disturb them and crack them open is pretty amazing. It'll be really neat when uh, Jerry Bromenshanks' uh, bee language gets to the point where the bees are talking to me through the genius hive and they're <laughs> telling me it's time to feed. Well, you may not want to hear what they're telling you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of days, I'm sure that's that's the right thing. Hey, I wanted to let everyone know that uh, the, the World Bee Count, um, they had a, a large social media push during Pollinator Week. Uh, we missed getting the episode out in time for that, so that may have wrapped up by the time you hear this episode uh, on in, in the first week of July. But they are still collecting photos, and you can still submit them. And, and go out and look at all the photos around the world. It's really amazing to see all the photographs that are out there from not only United States, and you can find yours out there, or you can see my photographs from Olympia. Uh, you can go out and see where the pollinators from the Indonesia countries and across Europe, across Canada. It's, have you been out there, Kim? It's pretty amazing. It is. And did you see the number of po- photos they've got this year? already yeah it's pushing 20,000 wow it's it's pretty amazing um did you post any mine are ready to go tomorrow there you go and I, yeah i'm gonna make it on time but i was out today i took a couple and there's i got I, i've got some things that bloom only in the morning and i oh. want to get them i want to get uh, uh i've got some flies that visit them so i want to get those tomorrow oh that'll be nice that'll be real nice well, i'll go out and look for them I know that it won't show me exactly where you live, but I know approximately the three-kilometer circle you live, and I'll be able to find your photos. There you go. Well, that about wraps it up for this podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download or stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, find a rev- uh, write a review and let us know what you like. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued sponsorship of the Beekeeping Today podcast as we head off into our third season. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else today, Kim? Well, I guess uh, you probably pretty much wrapped it up. Stay tuned for next Monday when we've got a show, and then Kirsten Trainer's coming back again a couple of times this month. So uh, it should be a good month. Yeah, July will be a good year. <laughs> July will be a good year. I hope it doesn't feel like a whole year and a whole month, but <laughs> it's a good month. All right, take care. Be careful, be safe. <laughs>